hello and welcome to Superb Woman Sundays at 7. I'm your host, Janet Neal, the founder and queen bee of the Superb Woman Incorporated. Glad that you've joined us. Now, this is a little bit different than our usual Superb Woman Sundays show because this is uh, someone who's already been on the show about maybe two years ago now. Judith Glazer is my guest today. And the reason I have Judith back is because she... Well, she's a very remarkable woman and continues to be um, an example of a superb woman, a woman who's comfortable in her own skin, who has taken the time to understand who she is, what she has to give, and is using that and putting back powerful energy into the world. Judah's story is a really amazing one. When I first interviewed her, and I encourage you to go back and watch that interview here on my YouTube channel, The Superb Woman, and you can find out the interview where I was getting to the point where Judith was telling her story about um, where she was and how she got to the point of being a cultural anthropologist and someone who was encouraging conversations. Um, and during that conversation that I had with her, I learned that she was a breast cancer survivor. And not only was she a breast cancer survivor, but she found out that she had um, breast cancer in New York City on 9-11. And the rest of her story is really remarkable. So please go back and watch that video. But for now, watch this video, because Judith will tell you the rest of her story. So welcome, I'm here with my guest, Judith Glazer. And as I had said, Judith is on a journey. And the last time we talked, Judith was telling her story um, about how she had gotten a cancer diagnosis on September 11th and uh, her journey up till that point. And that was about two years ago, I think, Judith, that we talked. Yeah, it was two years ago that we talked. I yeah, and the, the 2011 was actually September 11th, 2011. So, right, that, right, right. That's a long time ago, a really long, long, long time ago. And um, uh, it's, it's amazing to see how many years, what, well, how many years ago is that? It's 16 years ago, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And yep. what the journey has been for me over those 16 years, when I look back, it's, it's kind of a stunning uh, realization. Uh, about so many things, Janet. It's amazing. And I know we're going to be talking today about some of those yeah. insights and landmarks. and <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, and and that's, that's why I asked you to be back on the show um, this time, because I saw you speak at an event, um, just share, not get up and um, do a talk. Mm -hmm. But it moved me so much because you, I have always experienced you as being a woman who um, is on a self-discovery journey mm -hmm. um, and is always curious, uh, which I think is such a, um, a strong quality to have, especially I've noticed that with superb women, that they um, have a curiosity about themselves, about life. Um, they're always looking to learn and grow. And your journey has taken, um, twists and turns that um, are so different than where you were when we first talked. So why don't you bring us up to um, speed here mm -hmm. and tell everybody where you are today and, you know, how you got to this place. Mm. And, and I will mention one thing that um, I think has been always in the background, like the wallpaper in the background of my mind. I, I grew up in a family um, where my mother was diagnosed with cancer when I was 11 and a half. So I knew cancer was going to be in our family and we got BRCA tested and tested for all these kinds of things. And so it's, it's something that I would assume as I did that it's not something I can change. It's just there. Right. Mm -hmm. My mother passed away when I was 22. So mm -hmm. she, I, we, we lived through the 10 years and she had um, a melanoma on her leg that uh, because it wasn't treated right away, spread in her body, and she had like something like seven cancers. So, yeah, it's really sad. And and so I knew I didn't spend time thinking about it a lot. But when it first came up, of all dates in the world, September eleventh, two thousand and one, at the exact same time the World Trade Center was being attacked. Afterwards, I wrote a journal about how the world was being attacked and my body was being attacked. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. 
So, so with that in mind, the good news is that it was a small tumor. The bad news is that it was stage four, which again, fast growing, rapid growing. And they suggested that there might be some in my bones. Well, I, my doctor went from maybe no, not even radiation to radiation and then to chemotherapy. And so then I experienced chemo and um, it did help. Mm -hmm. And my hair grew back. You lose it all. And then, you know how women, we are worried about those. Right. Right. I took off my wigs um, on, on a cruise going to for a week to Greece and um, and Italy. And that was an incredible thing to experience. So, I'm sure, you know, my coming back to life um, uh -huh. and things were good after that, Janet. I mean, you know, I even forgot about it, if you can imagine. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't have a double mastectomy back then. It was a little lumpectomy and I went through chemo and, and I moved on. Mm -hmm. um, lo and behold, I... I seemed to be able to, I found the first lump, I found the second one, which wow. I found somewhere wow. in July, end of July, 2015. So it was a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, went to the same doctor and it was, um, they said, you need a double mastectomy. We mm -hmm. can't pull around based on your history. So right. um, I made appointments and um, went right into the hospital to do it. And Knowing, again, my family's history, I was prepared for the operation. I mean, I didn't, I just said, take, take whatever you have to do. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, my daughter, four months before me, I was with her when she got diagnosed with breast cancer and she had a double, before I did, a double mastectomy. She just said, the doctor said, we'll take it off. No, she said, both breasts, let's just do yeah. it now. Yeah. Yeah. Thank God she did that because they found cancer in her second breast, which they had wow. identified. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, I, Janet, I keep thinking that there are some angels watching over me, and I hope that your listeners are okay with me talking this way, because my daughter somehow sensed it was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I went in and, and had both breasts um, uh, replaced, and I thought everything was fine. Again, I was just, this was just my second round to take care of a problem. It turns out that it wasn't healing. And so I could tell it wasn't healing. I had tremendous pain underneath my breasts. Mm. So, so bad that I couldn't sleep in my own bed because the mm. mattress didn't support me in a way that I needed to. And, and here's what's fascinating. I'm going to take some little divergent journeys for people listening because this is where um, I went to my doctor and I said, I have pain here. And she said, well, I'll send you to a pain doctor. Now, mm. doctors who are in their own silos have certain cohorts that they work with and others they don't. Right. And nobody ever envisioned that there was something else going on in my body. Mm -hmm. And so we couldn't get into that pain doctor. We didn't want to wait. And I said to my husband, I'm putting myself in the hospital. So this, mm -hmm. these are the miracles. Like my body was saying, don't sit and wait for some doctor to be ready. And it may not be the right doctor. Go in. And I went in and I spent a week there. And the first doctor that saw me, again, my miracle, uh, wasn't the doctor who was there. He's supposed to be there. He wasn't a GP. He was a specialist in gastrointestinal diseases. Oh, wow. Wow. And had he not been the doctor, like the other doctor who said, oh, it's pain, I'll send you to a pain doctor, yeah. I might have been missed again. And every day counts exactly. when you're having cancer. Exactly. And so the doctor looked at me and he went like this and he said, do you know you're jaundiced? And I said, what does that mean? And he said, well, something's going on inside that we have to really further explore. And I said, well, how do you know? And he said, did you have red dots on your chest? And I said, that's funny you should say I did, but I went to a dermatologist to put cream on it, and I got rid of it. Again, doctors not knowing. Wow. Unless it's the right doctor. Right. It was misdiagnosed the first, the, that time. The dermatologist said, oh, I'll just give you cream and it'll go away, and it went away. But now it didn't help me. And what was it? It was the, uh, so I did have jaundice. Jaundice had to do with pancreas. Right. It has to right. do with stomach. And so they had to put a stent in my body to enable me to digest food because I was also losing weight beside the pain. Mm -hmm. And the doctor immediately said, tonight I'm doing an operation. I'm not waiting until tomorrow. And when he went inside, again, he was very intelligent about this. Um, he went in and he said, this is a symptom. This is not the end game. Uh -huh. And he turned his scope inside my body as he was, after he finished putting the stent in, uh -huh. and he looked up at my pancreas and he saw a five inch tumor wrapped around the top of my pancreas. Oh my goodness. And so when he came, I came out of surgery, um, I think he waited until the next day because they, I, they might have taken a, a, a piece of the tissue just to do a you know biopsy, mm -hmm. and it was confirmed because it could be lots of things malignant, non-malignant, and it was malignant stage four, 
pancreatic cancer, which was simultaneously growing while my breast cancer was, was there. In fact, it could have been because of its size, this big, you know, it's really big. Wow. Um, he, it could have been growing before I even had right. the breast cancer. Breast cancer, right. And they weren't connected. It's not like, so because... No, it wasn't a metastasized kind of cancer. It was two separate kinds of things. Two separate cancers. And the way they know it is, again, they, they biopsied uh, my cells and everything to find out in the tumor. Um, and here's the part that everybody needs to know. You have, doctors need to be better trained in some cases about their patient care. Mm -hmm. Because the next day after he had done this uh, check of me, he came in and he said, and I said, so what's going on? And he said, in front of my family, with no other preparation to get me ready to receive the information. Mm -hmm. He said, he said, you have pancreatic cancer. And I said, well, what does that mean? And he said, it's a five centimeter tumor and you have either two weeks, two months or two years to live. No other options, Janet. No, no, nothing about this is how we're going to check it out. This is what you need to know. He took the statistics Wow. Dropped it in my lap in front of my children. And I still have emblazoned in my brain the picture of my son's face and my oh, daughter's face hearing this. And my, my daughter, I mean, imagine what this means no, to a family. I imagine. Yeah. Um, and my daughter, I'll stop in a second so you can, you know, if you have some questions to ask. But um, I, my daughter said that as she looks back, she's never hated anybody in her life except this doctor. I bet. I bet. That was very painful. So this, yeah, so you have quite a story there that was, because uh, I had seen you not long before that, and everything seemed fine. Mm -hmm. There was nothing that appeared like you were ill at all. And then, you know, a few months later, I hear, I'm like, oh, I haven't seen Judith, where is she? And then I hear what happened, and I was like, what? And, and that's not the end of the story, because um, you've gone through all of this, and you've come out the other side with some new wisdom and some new attitudes. So what, what has going through this process again done for you from a, a perspective? Uh, no. Perspective. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. <laughs> what, it, what it's given me is something I never anticipated. Um, people go through cancer and they have different relationships with cancer. And I'm going to put it that way because that's how I experienced or that's how I chose to experience it. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, I've been through cancer. My mother has been through cancer. I've seen it. It's in my family. What do I want to say to myself about cancer? Right. And how do I want to treat cancer in my, in my lexicon in my life? Mm -hmm. And I said, I want to make cancer my friend. I don't care what kind of cancer it is. The, what I learned about uh, pancreatic cancer is that 4% of the population live. It is the most lethal cancer you can have. Mm -hmm. It did metastasize in my body, by the way. Oh, it did. And had we known about it three weeks earlier, mm -hmm. it may have been, I may have been saved from the metastases. It's very quick, mm -hmm. quick growing. And so what it meant is, in fact, um, when they went in and did a body scan, they found that I had a, a pancreatic cancer that was growing in my throat or close to my throat. Wow. Um, and that, and that's when they put me on chemo right away. They rushed me into, they moved up my, um, chances of getting into chemo. They moved out other people so I could mm -hmm. get into chemo very quickly. Um, and I decided that I was going to have a conversation and find out what it was here to teach me. Mm. And, uh, and in my conversations with, with cancer, um, I figured out the following things, which for me have been the anchor and the hard rock that I hold on to and the sacred rock that I hold on to, mm. um, that I got breast cancer for a reason. And that is that it's about, breasts are about nurturing, at least in a mother, right? Mm. And nurturing your baby. And I, I said what I had learned, and I had a, a, call, a reading with a psychic. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, she said, uh, you, the word that came, that is coming to me for you as your gift to hold on to is the word allow. And I said, what does allow mean? And she said, allow means that you have been, you give to the world. You've been working with people forever. You are not allowing people to come back in and help you. Mm -hmm. It's always you helping others. And so after a while, you run out of steam. And so uh, steam is my word. That wasn't her word. <laughs> 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 However, it, 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 I need, human beings need the give and take, the exchange back and forth of helping each other in this complex world. And I wasn't getting help from people. And so 
uh, for my breast cancer, it was um, the nurturing that I needed. You no, know, that's not unusual that you say that. I have actually heard that um, from several different sources, that that is a common thing, that women who get breast cancer are usually the women who are the nurturers, who are give, 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 and, and uh, do not, you know, put themselves very low on that that list. Um, they'll give to everybody else and not take care of themselves. Mm. So it doesn't surprise me at all that you say well, that. So I think this is wisdom. This is universal wisdom that over the centuries, maybe forever, we, we learned. And wise people, if we have wise people in our life to help us and teach us that, <clears throat> it's very important to know. So that took care of my breast cancer for me. Then I said, well, what about pancreatic cancer? Yeah. Pancreas is about nourishing. You can't digest your food. The stent yeah. that I had put in was to enable me to have produce bile in a natural way, to open up the bile ducts mm. and have it help me digest my food. And when I was going through pancreatic cancer, I lost 45 pounds. Oh, my goodness. That's one, that was one-third of my body weight, basically. And, wow. yeah, it's, uh, and that, that was a huge thing. I couldn't walk up the steps mm. because yeah. I didn't have enough muscle. Or everything... Right. Right, was disintegrating. So um, that was my thing is about how do I nourish? How do I nurture? And then, um, and I went through chemo, by the way, the cancer markers, the doctor had never seen this ever in the history of all his patients. I had 600 chemo markers. It was a C19-9. That's the, what they call the chemo or the cancers that they were measuring. It dropped from almost 600 uh, points down to 30, down to 16, which is normal in three and a half months. And that was because? I was on chemo, but it was because other things. Mm -hmm. I decided nourishing, nurturing, that I needed to do more of this interaction with people and make it healthy. And I launched a program which had been in, in the works for almost a year and was now launching January. Now here I had my doctor telling me on the 24th of December that I had pancreatic cancer and that it was, right? And then my program started on the 18th of January, and we had a thousand coaches in the program. And they were—it's a webinar, 65 countries. Wow! And I almost canceled it because I didn't know, based on what the doctor said, am I going right. to be here? Right? right. So we started taping some of the things, and and other parts were live. And I told the people that were part of my coach, coaching cohort, I said, I want to be—I want to share with you what's going on with me, and I—you just need to know if I act funny or if I start to sound different, that mm -hmm. it, it could be the impact of the cancer mm -hmm. therapy for me. Mm -hmm. And I told them, and the next, and one of the women said out of the thousand, we need to start a prayer group for you. Cause people said, should we email you and, you know, check in with you. And I said, no, I can't do that. I'll be on emails all the time. Right. And she was so smart and she said, let's do prayers. And so in mm -hmm. 65 countries, coaches on the program did prayers for me every day. Oh, and then between that and the beautiful conversations that we had, because they're learning conversational intelligence with me, mm -hmm. and it gave me a chance to um, both give them what they needed from a wisdom standpoint, but also get back and allow them to... Allowing it, yes. Allowing it. And they challenged me, and I gave them more, and then they challenged me. And so there was a nice virtuous cycle mm -hmm. that, according to my doctor, he said he's never seen that drop in chemo markers, that there had to be something else. He said, you're my miracle patient. Oh, wow. So I, oh, wow. I, you know, doctors don't believe in spiritual things by, <laughs> by nature, right? They, it's all about the medicine. So I, I said, well, let me just, let's keep track of things. And during the time I was in the program and things were going well and the conversations were great, my chemo markers went, were in the normal zone. Hmm. Then we had a little blip where we were going through a stressful time where it was the certification part and we had not been prepared for all the things we had to learn how to do very quickly as a team. This is certification of your coaching program. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And my, my, and they put me on an experimental drug. The chemo was over and they put me on an experimental drug and the drug didn't work. First okay. of all, mm -hmm. and I have my pills here because I'm back on this at full dose. Mm. Full, full dose is $600 a day. Oh, covered by insurance or no? Yeah, knock on wood. And we pay a, per, a small percentage, but they pay the rest. Wow. wow. And if this works, we're still, now we're testing the full dose, then I could be this on this for the rest of my life. Oh my goodness. I have to be the most expensive patient that 
<laughs> that uh, Ed has ever had. Actually, there probably is more, but wow. Yeah, it's it's a lot. Yeah. Wait, yeah. I dropped one of the pills under the seat of my oh. car. And I said to my husband, stop, that's $40. <laughs> <laughs> and so anyway, wow. so I'm back on I'm back on chemo now, but what I noticed is I had some little things. I don't have to go into all the details where I ended up in the hospital again and I had to pump up my immune system. During that time, I was not on chemo and my cancer markers dropped precipitously to, on two, two times. You could see it. Mm -hmm. And so my takeaway, and, and I'd love to talk with you about this, is that in addition to the drugs, because I wasn't on chemo then, right? I wasn't on the experimental drug then. It was just me in the world right. that I was allowing the spirit of the people that I was communicating with in our program and the healthy conversations we were having to be part of my, my therapy, basically the yeah. chemical therapy. Yeah. So, so you're all about, and the name of your book is conversational intelligence. intelligence. Yeah. And so share with people what you mean by conversational intelligence about having intelligent conversations and what that means. What, what it, first of all, what I learned, uh, about the genetics of conversations and where that fits into our DNA mm -hmm. is that we have um, what are called template genes and they give us our basic characteristics as human beings. And you inherit a lot of those from your family. So you look like your mother or your father and those, those kinds of things that we can see and put together our construct as a human being. However, there are what are called transcription genes and those genes are turned on and off based on our interaction with the environment around us. Oh, interesting. And so it turns out that conversations, the FOXP2 gene, which is your language gene, is one of those template genes that gets turned on and off, as are, is the quality of our character, who we are, who we become, our values and things like that, which are more subtle, that come from interacting with the world around us. Really? Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. So, wow. so the quality of the conversations that you have directly impacts your life. In, and it, it directs your life. It guides your life. It is uh -huh. the North Star. And so if you grow up uh, in a family that was not nice to you, where you had parents that punished you a lot and put you in your room and told you when you were doing things wrong all the time. Right. Negative you, feedback all the time. Negative, negative feedback. Believe it or not, I, and I watch a lot of these TV shows like Law and Order, and you may watch them too, you know, Criminal Minds. Mm -hmm. The story of everyone, 100% of the people is that they had horrible experiences right. growing up and were not loved. And now they're going to get back at the people. Right. And, and so if we know that now mm -hmm. and we can see it in the brain and what parts of the brain activate when we're being in conversations with others, even subtle things like turning your head, looking down, making a sneer at your face, you know, right. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, it's like you know, what did I just say? And then right. you start to self doubt and things like that. Right that we have to learn that there's a neuroscience behind healthy and unhealthy conversations. And so conversational intelligence gives us the methodologies, the frameworks, the rituals, all the things that we can do to shift the chemistry and to begin to notice when we need to shift the chemistry. Mm. So bringing it back to your experiences, what I love about the message that you impart is how you take what is, and really want to learn from it and to make it better, not only for yourself, but for others in the process. Mm -hmm. So gratitude just is something that exudes out of you, um, mm -hmm. which you wouldn't think in someone who has gone through everything that you've gone through. So tell us a little bit more about the role of gratitude in your life. Um, it's, I think for me, gratitude is, is being grateful for certain things things happening the way they happen. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I have to say there's an underpinning of belief that I am steering, I'm navigating the ship that I'm on as well. Mm -hmm. In other words, I'm not just uh, given a set of genes mm -hmm. and that's the way my life is going to unfold and, and, mm -hmm. you know, and somebody rolled the dice for me, I didn't roll it. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it's, it's a gratitude or a gratefulness for what I've been given and then how to use it in a way that um, really, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm here for a purpose is what I've learned. Mm -hmm. And maybe that purpose was to go through the experience that I did with cancer and right. then go around the world. And because it reinforces for me even more strongly that I need to talk about conversations because if my chart, and I have a chart of the cancer markers dropping when I had no chemo, when I had no experimental drug and it was just yeah. those conversations, 
my chart shows with and without chemo. And I know that I was there to, you know, so I have gratitude for people doing the experiment with me. I had a thousand coaches first year, 1,250 this year wow. who are working with me to experiment with having healthy conversations, even if they're difficult. Wow. So tell me, what is a healthy conversation? So um, we have a model in conversational intelligence. It's the trust model. And in order for human beings to bring the best of their selves, sometimes we can't, as you know, like we feel, oh, I can't tell that person that. I can't talk with that group about that. Mm -hmm. And you have all these things that are inhibiting you, which are then putting walls around you. Right. That's not healthy. If I can't be transparent mm -hmm. in my own family, in my own yeah. relationship with my spouse, with my children, if I can't say to you, I need you to do something different with me tomorrow, starting tomorrow. I want to be able to, and what I call, I, so I create a language for conversational intelligence. I need to help you uh, or help you understand what I need. And then and you'll be able to change our environment together. And you can do the same with me. Mm -hmm. So I want to upregulate certain things. I want to spend more time. Upregulate means do more of. It doesn't, I don't have a start, stop and continue language in conversational intelligence. It doesn't work because our inner chemistry doesn't turn on and off so quickly. It's fluid. Okay. It's electricity. Right, so you right, can't right. tell the electricity to stop if it wants to fire, right? Yeah. So I've created a language that makes um, the inner world and the outer world accessible. And that um, the language of do more of and do less of. So instead of having difficult conversations, we have conversations about how to develop the next generation of thinking together. What do we need to do differently with each other? What do you need to do more of? What do you need to do less of? And so this language of conversational intelligence is designed to match what goes on inside mm. of us so we can regulate it together and create environments where we can serve be. And I'm not calling it servant leadership because it's not the same thing, mm. but we can, we can support each other's growth and development. Mm. And good. you need to know this more people are living to be over a hundred. We just had a guy that's 117 that was in the news. Yes. A woman. I'm sorry. A woman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, so we're meant to live longer and we're meant to live healthier. And these are some of the things, you know, what do we need to do differently with each other to be in support of each other? So we are we. We're not eyes arguing. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> we're we's. Yes. Excellent. Well, yeah. Judith, you just... Uh... I am so grateful that uh, you are a person in my life and that I have been able to learn from you, from your journey. Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful that you decided to come back on here and share your, your story with the, the rest of our tribe out there. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything else you, you want to share before we wrap things up here? Um, can I share a teeny little story? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Sure. Okay, so when, before I had people sign up for my programs that started a year and a half ago, um, I didn't have anyone signed up, mm -hmm. and then I didn't know what would come about. And so I did what's called an immersion for an hour and a half, and people could tune in. And the first uh, year, we had 12,500 people sign up to listen, which is amazing. And the second year, we had 15,000 more. I mean, it's wow. just, yeah, so it's it's pretty incredible. And I got a phone call uh, after I think my fourth um, session, immersion session, from a woman from Australia. And she said, I listened to you and my instincts are telling me that you can help me with my daughter. And mm -hmm. so we talked. And for four and a half minutes, she talked at me and I could feel her energy and I could feel how strong she was and I can feel how dominant she was and on and on. Mm -hmm. and at the end of four and a half minutes, I said, and, and, and I learned that her daughter was they had to move to a farm because she was on some type of spectrum, but it wasn't autism. And then nobody knew what it was. Interesting. And for years, the child was in this abyss of not, not knowing what hmm. was going on for her. Hmm. I, I gave her feedback and I said, look, um, do me a favor. I, I feel the push. I feel the pressure. I feel the energy. Three, change three things. I want you to listen to connect, not judge or reject. I know you're judging. You're judging her. You're judging your inability as a mother to figure it out. You're judging all sorts of things. You've got to listen to connect to her heart and just and be a good listener in that way. Mm -hmm. I said, and I want you to ask questions for which you don't have answers. Don't keep telling her, do this, try this, do this. I could feel that. And I said, leave space for her to step into the conversation with you. That's all. Three things. Interesting. Those are part of what we call conversational essentials. 
These are things that we do every day, but if we do them differently, if we listen not to understand what the person is saying, that's old for me. That's listening to the words and repeating back and confirming what you know. That's the lowest level in my universe conversational matrix it's transactional right if you right and so i want you to listen to connect i want you to ask questions pull that's pull energy not push energy and give her room to jump into that space with you to find that space and then jump in mm -hmm. and i said call me after your conversation and she called me back from australia and she said this is the best conversation i ever had with my daughter now i couldn't assume that three years or five years of her past history with her child that this conversation was going to transform everything right right however i said if you could hold that pattern and continue to do it with your child let's connect again and see what happens well mm -hmm. she and her husband both lawyers with their daughter flew to the usa to new york city and met with me oh wow wow so that they, they flew to the u.s just to meet with you um i think they had a bar mitzvah too <laughs> <laughs> Oh, let's go with the first story. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, they had to go from California to That's New York. So that, that they did incredible. do close to meet me, right? And then they spent time in New York. Um, and they watched the daughter connect to me. They could feel and see how we were connecting. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So fast forward two and a half years later, we fly to Australia. I had a speaking engagement and we spent a week with them. They literally hosted us for a week wow. there. I got to see their daughter. What they saw is their daughter's transformation throughout the last couple of years they moved from a farm to a house they moved to a city in sydney instead of melbourne um, the daughter ended up in a private school she's i said to them i think your daughter is a like a rabbi i don't know how to describe it i could feel that in her mm -hmm. and they had never even thought of that mm -hmm. it turns out that her their daughter is the only one of the teenagers who doesn't drink she's in a sorority she did it when I was visiting. She was telling me about how she had to go back to the sorority to protect her or her colleagues because they were going to be so drunk that they would <laughs> fall. You know. Right? <laughs> but when you hear her talk, she has a uniqueness. Her voice was not like the group; it was her own mm. unique voice. Mm. And between the mother and people telling her how to be and what to do and why she couldn't rather than could, it screwed up her brain's wiring and getting into the rhythm of at pulling and not pushing and getting those energies to work like this so that you have a pedal for your whole being yeah. it it changed her life and she's brilliant and she has a huge iq and she's got a huge heart and she's gorgeous and and i know that that wouldn't have happened if she hadn't practiced some of these skills oh so my whole thing with superb women mm -hmm. it's all about the bee so it's all about allowing somebody to be themselves and to give them the space and as you're talking about is is learning to have the kind of conversations that the give and take um that allows this being um to flourish yeah human beings have a need for fairness in their life fairness is we talk we listen we talk we listen and believe it or not people who have studied the chemistry of um, psychologists, psychiatrists, neuroscientists, it, when we lose our rhythm, then we can't dance with the world. Mm, yep, yep. And so some of the therapies are literally taking people back into when they were in the womb and exercising movements that are that primitive right. to put into place a rhythm with the world around you. And when you have that rhythm, great music plays. So mm, Beautiful. Well, thank you for sharing that story. That's a, that's a beautiful story. Mm, thank you. Very that's illustrative of um, the power of intelligent conversations. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And based on what I've learned about you and what you're doing, and we've talked about your work and our work, and there's a lot of wisdom that sitting, we're sitting on top of. Yeah. And, and, and I want to just end with, it's important to learn, how to learn who we are and bring our unique being into the world absolutely that's that creates health in the best ways possible absolutely yeah. well i want to thank you for being who you are um, and sharing that with all of us today it's been my treat a thrill for me and thank you for being such a great listener so oh, i appreciate you. that okay and thank all of you and come back for another episode of superb woman sundays at seven until then have a superb week take care